If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There's a worksheet back there if you want a worksheet. I bet Scott would even bring you one. You'll just raise your hand. God will bring it to you. I want to talk to you tonight about do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. And our outline is as follows. Number one, we have a glorious ministry. We have a glorious ministry. Number two, we have a powerful testimony. We have a powerful testimony. And number three, we have a divine purpose. We have a divine purpose. Father, be with us tonight as we study your word. And God, I thank you that there are just such encouraging scriptures in your word. And uh, if anybody uh, had and went through uh, hard times and uh, discouraging times, it truly was the Apostle Paul. But God, I thank you for you inspiring him and the writing of the scripture, which we are about to study. So God, just be with us tonight, God. I just pray uh, if there's just one thought uh, that would encourage us in the faith this week, I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, burn that in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, in this day in which we live, it would be easy to get discouraged because all that is going on around us. Matter of fact, if you watch the news for more than five minutes, you could get discouraged. But we as Christians should be the happiest people on earth, and we should be ministers of hope to everyone we come in contact with. That hope comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, extremely challenging times seem to be the new normal, but it is encouraging to know that we do not have to go it alone as believers. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, 5, that the Lord will never leave us and he will never forsake us. Let's look at these thoughts from the life of the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Three times in this text, you will see that phrase, we do not lose heart. And folks, uh, when you think about ministry, uh, and, and I know the natural thing you think about is paid ministers, but we all have a personal ministry when we get saved. And I jotted down this little thought. Uh, I was thinking about this yesterday. Ministry is an honor, and ministry is a privilege. And to be able to represent uh, Jesus Christ and to be able to, and really, if you want to boil down to what ministry is, it's meeting the needs of others. It's helping others. That's what true ministry is. So we have received mercy, so we should not lose heart. Verse 2, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness or handling of the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the true, truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And what Satan wants us to do, he wants us to live in the past. He wants to bring up our path. And I hope you understand, folks, when you get saved, your sins are erased as far as the east from the west. And, and Jesus Christ, his blood, his life paid for our sins. And what will happen is when we start to get involved in ministry, that's when he goes into action. Now, if you're not, you know, if you're, if you're just attending church, all right, you know, there's a lot of times that, you know, he, he doesn't feel like he has to mess with you or tempt you. But when you get down in, you know, ministry and get down uh, your hands dirty with people, and folks, you know this, where you see people, there's problem. But the key to ministry is there are answers to all problems in life. So Paul is saying right off the bat, don't let Satan discourage you. Do not listen to his voice. He wants to discourage you and keep you from ministry. And do you know what? I've learned and I've seen this in 43 years of ministry. Sometimes it only takes one bad experience for people to pull back and not be active in ministry. And folks, I am telling you that craftiness is coming from Satan. 
Now look at verse 3. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. And Paul still is talking about our past, okay? This was before you met Christ. I call it my B.C. days, uh, personally. But, but there it says, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And I am telling you, when it gets to ministry, the greatest ministry we have as Christians is to lead someone to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're talking about they were headed towards hell. We were talking about they were living in darkness. We were talking about they were cap captivated with sin. And, and, you know, God is the one who forgives. And when we have the privilege of leading someone to Christ, everything changes. A light comes on in their hearts and in their minds. So verse 5, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And folks, that is what we have to understand. In our Christian walk, it is not about us. It is not, see if I can do more than you do. It is not a competition. We are put here as a body of Christ to work together for the purpose of of winning souls to Jesus Christ. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ the Lord, ourselves, your bond servants, for Jesus' sake. And even in another text, you remember, Paul called himself the chiefest of sinners. Because you think about his life before he was saved, but, but everything changed, and God called Paul to the ministry and he, I, in my opinion, was one of the best human examples of what a true believer is. In verse 6, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our, shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Folks, I don't know about you, but I cannot wait to see Jesus face to face. I think we have all of eternity. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, that's going to be a long line there, all right? I may start out with Paul or Peter or one of the other guys, but that's not what this means. It's saying that we, through our witnessing, through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, we shine light on those who are in darkness. And many of them just don't know. They don't understand the gospel. Maybe they weren't raised in church. Maybe they were indoctrinated in a, in a false gospel or in some cult of some kind. But when they come to Christ, I'm telling you, they are different people. And I shared that with, at the end of the invitation a week ago. Lisa, I'm telling you, when she came in and we started talking, you could just see the burden on her face. And the minute, one, one thing, we held hands and I was praying, and she just about, I mean, she put the squeeze on my hands, and when she opened her eyes, tears were flowing down her face, and her countenance totally changed. And so we see how the gospel, you know, is, is for God and for the glory of God. I, look at Matthew 5. I know you know this, but we need to, we need to look at it. We need reminders, even of common scriptures. Matthew 5, verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its savor, how shall it be seasoned? Folks, I don't want to ever get in my Christian life where it's just routine, where I'm just going church, or I'm just attending church, all right? I want to worship God. I want to engage with God. I want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it says, it is good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled under by men. And when you think of the effect of salt, all right, every once in a while my sweet mother would make biscuits and gravy, and every once in a while, guess what she would forget? Salt. Now, do you think for a minute, I mean, I put the first one in my mouth. You know how it is. You, you see something, you're thinking, this is going to be it. 
and you put it in your mouth and there's no salt in it, I'm telling you, I said, Mom, what did you do? And salt, salt changes many things. And we as Christians, our lives should so be tuned in with Christ that people see a difference in us. You are a light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Folks, we do stand out. We have the light of the gospel of Christ. Our life, our lives should shine light on others. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Folks, I want to be so in tune with Jesus and with God. When I walk into a room, I'm not trying to command that room. I, I want people to know without even asking me, all right, that dude's a Christian. You know what I get quite a bit? Steve probably does the same thing. I'll be in a hospital, and I'll be walking down the hall looking for a number, and they'll look at me, and they go, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I'm thinking, yeah, I am. Why do you say that? I can just tell. All right, and, and that's kind of cool when that happens to us. We don't even have to say it. You know, I, I'm not passing out my resumes in hospitals, all right? I'm not trying to impress anybody with my spiritual, you know, what I've done spiritually or my spiritual resume. We live life, and we need to let our light shine. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's not a thing of look what I've done it's a thing of look what God's done in me. And when God is in you, he can work through you. 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4, talking about we have a glorious ministry. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Preach the word. And I heard this phrase one time, sometimes use words. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a neat thing. Our life is an open book. Our life is a sermon. Our lives, people can read us. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Folks, God gives us divine appointments all the time, and sometimes we are so busy doing other things that we do not recognize that, hey, we, we could have talked to that person about Christ until after we're not with them anymore. And it says... Preach the word, be ready in season now, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And folks, these are the things, and these are characteristics, and these are fruits of the Spirit. All right? You know, not everyone's going to get saved the first time you present the gospel. You, you know, and even when, you, when the, you're, the gospel is rejected, you should never take it personally. They're not rejecting you, all right? They're rejecting God and Jesus and the gospel. Verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Well, I got news for you folks, the time has come. The world in which we live in, we are living this every day of our lives. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside unto fables. And folks, we have now we've kind of got that what I call smorgasbord ministry or teaching and preaching. If I don't like one set or I don't like a way a church does this, I just go to another and I try to find something that appeals to me. Okay? And uh, to me, the Word of God is truth. When it speaks on hell, we need to preach on hell. When it, when it speaks of certain subjects that are sometimes uncomfortable. And folks, you know, there, it should not be in hate. It should not be in condescending matter. It's just speaking the truth in love, and that is so, so important. But you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions. That watchful is keep those spiritual ears up. Look for divine appointments. Now look what it says. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Folks, that is the, you know, the most important thing that we do is share the gospel with others. And we all have ministries 
that we can be a part of. Some people, they don't want to work in the nursery or they don't want to work with children. And that's fine if you're not called to that. But there is something God wants you to do. God gives you a ministry to do, and we need to be active in that ministry. The old song I wrote down, Michael W. Smith, I don't know if you remember this, love is not love until you give it away. Folks, we as Christians need to give love away. So we see we have a glorious ministry. We have a powerful testimony. Powerful testimony. Back at uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What is he talking about a treasure? All right. I believe he's talking about three things. Our talents, our gifts, and the Holy Spirit. Folks, God has given you something that you are good at. God has given you something that it's your passion. You want to do this. I mean, when you're doing this, you feel fulfilled. And so we have that treasure, okay? We are being used by God. And we know how treasures are. Treasures are something that we treasure, something that is meaningful, all right? Uh, that the excellent of the power may be of God and not of us. Folks, we are not performing, okay? We are not, you know, trying to go up the spiritual ladder where people can see us or, you know, we're not doing things that, you know, and I have seen a few arrogant preachers in my days and I just, I just do not like to be around them. They almost act like they're God's gift to the ministry. And folks, that should not be. Verse 8, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. You know, hard pressed means there's pressure, okay? Uh, like even in our, in our own families, I really think some of the hardest people to witness to is our own family. And you have to understand, you know, uh, you know nobody said it was going to be easy. Nobody said, you know, it's always a rose garden. Nobody said you're not going to be challenged. But p hard pressing happens, and, and sometimes we feel crushed. We feel like we lost the battle or we lost that. We are perplexed. In times even in my life, I I've witnessed, and I'm telling you, you know, just like a gun, you know, some have six bullets. I've already shot five of them, all right? And I'm just thinking, what else can I say to this? person. And that's when I realize it's not what I say, it's what the Holy Spirit does. It's the Holy Spirit that saves them. It's the Holy Spirit that, that gives them uh, eternal life. But not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. And we really in America, we don't know very much about persecution. But I am telling you in third world countries, you know, uh, it, you, know, you know, to carry a Bible, you're going to get in trouble. If you say the name of Jesus, you're going to get in trouble. Uh, sometimes uh, you have to, missionaries have to be snuck in at night. Sometimes they literally have to fear for their lives. And this is what Paul is saying, but not, but not uh, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Listen, folks, you know, Satan's going to do his best to discourage you. He will do anything to get you to quit doing ministry. He will use people close to you sometimes. Okay? He will use people that you, you, you just, you're just like, wow, where did that come from? And you need to understand, folks, we're in a war. We're in a battle. Spiritual warfare is real. And it says always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. And it's talking about death there. And folks, you think of what Jesus went through on the cross. Folks, we will never personally go through what he went through on the cross. We will not take a beating with a cat of nine tails. We will not have nails driven through our hands and through our feet. And so you have to understand what Jesus went to to share 
salvation with us. A soul, one soul, sets out off music in heaven. And, and that's what we need to be realizing that, man, it's not always going to be easy. Sometimes it's going to be tired, hard. And, and Scott, you know this. I've been on mission trips where I've got up in the morning and I'm thinking, man, I need some help today. <laughs> man, I don't feel good. My stomach's upset. You know, uh, things aren't going great. And we think, you know, in some way that is persecution. But the example of Jesus on the cross, when I think of that, I think, you know what, Brother Mike, you, you need to be quiet. You, you don't know what you're talking about. That is not persecution. Jesus went through that for us. For we who live, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also uh, be manifested in our mortal flesh. And folks, there's, there's a lot of things and situations in life. I don't know why they happen. I don't have an answer of that. I don't have an, but just because things don't go well doesn't mean you have missed the will of God. Sometimes he wants you to go through these situations so that you can grow in the Lord, so that you can pray more, so you'll depend on God more. In Romans 8, 28, we all know what it says. Uh, uh, Romans 8, 28, uh, you got it up there? There we go. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So the good is for his glory. Okay, that's why, you know, you're going to run into situations, and the word we like to use is why. Why did God do this? Why did God allow this to happen? Well, folks, he has a purpose in everything he does. So then death is working in us, working in us, but life in you. And what he's saying is, folks, we're all going to end up dead anyway. I know that just sounds, I'm not flippantly saying that, but you think about it. If we aren't raptured out of here, we're all going to die. It's just how we're going to die. And I still say, you know, dying for the cause of Christ is an honor. To me, it would be an honor. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, and therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore we speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and present us with you. What is he saying? The, what is he saying the key to ministry is? I believe. Folks, it's all about faith. Without faith, what does the Bible say? It's impossible to please God. And we hit that second tier or that rim, that rim of where we, we see Jesus for who he is. And we believe, in some, we believe in somebody we've never seen. We believe in somebody that has never verbally had a conversation with. I know we pray and I understand all that. But it's the key to this kind of living is faith believing that God is going to be faithful and we are going to be victorious. For all the things are for your sakes. Well, I wish, and I've heard Christians say, well, I wish he'd give me a break. I wish he'd just slow things down. I wish all these things wouldn't happen, you know, so quickly and all these bad things happen to me, you know. And folks, he has a purpose and a reason for those things. For all things are for your sakes that grace, having spread through many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Galatians 2. Galatians 2. Look at this. Galatians 2, 19. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. Folks, it's not the law that saves us. It's not being religious. It is Jesus who saves us. It's being righteousness our righteousness is found in him. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Folks, that's what the Christian walk is. It's Christ being in every area of your life. 
is Christ uh, being you know, on your tongue and in your mouth and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. These things are so important. Christ is who is important. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. There's that word faith again, who loved me and gave himself for me. Folks, it's not a matter of him just cleaning us us up. He makes us new creatures, new beings. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if, the, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And we know that Christ did not die in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, 55. He's, Paul is talking about life and death here. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is a victory. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. You know what that means? Steadfast means be consistent. Be persistent. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Don't keep on going for Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And that's one thing, even as a pastor, you know, I make a list every Monday morning, but it is a rare thing for me to come to a Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock and say, ah, I've, I've done that. I've done my list for the week. Because there's still a phone call. I'll go home and I'll think of somebody that I didn't call. Or I'll be praying and going through my prayer list, and, and God will just reveal somebody to me. And, the, and he just impresses through the Holy Spirit, man, you need to stop. You need to stop and pray for this person. I don't know what's going on in their life. I personally don't know. But God says, and folks, that's what he is talking about there you know there's you know it's just like somebody that says well i don't know what to pray about well just pick up one of our lists you got plenty to pray for and really you shouldn't even have to have a list there should be names and people and situations that are just burning inside your heart and they've become a burden to you and that is so so important always abounding in the lord's work knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And again, I understand the rewards. But folks, truly, if our attitude is right, we're not doing things to get rewards. We're not doing things so people or men can, can express how great we are or what a good Christian they are. Folks, everything we do is for the Lord. It's for the Lord's work. It's for the kingdom of God. And that's what he's saying. We all have a powerful testimony. Matter of fact, I jotted down these words. Keep on going, growing, and glowing. All right? Every once in a while, I'm, you know, I have never seen that, but I was just, I guess it was yesterday. Keep on going, growing, and glowing as a Christian. Number three, we have a divine purpose a divine purpose. Look at 2 Corinthians again. Let's finish this up. Therefore, there's the word again, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And I know some of my best days in ministry to where you feel like, man, man, that was a good day. Well, folks, it's God who gives you those good days. It's God that gives you the talent that you have. It is God uh, through the Holy Spirit that directs our path. And sometimes, you know, we get so tired working and laboring, and I I always go back to mission work because, you know, I don't know about you, Scott, but I I can think of specific things that we did. Uh, We were one time down in Mexico, and I was leading that uh, for First Baptist Alma. 
That day, the heat index on a porch laying clay tile was 116 degrees. And we literally had to get ice water because there were two men, they passed out. So one of the ladies' job was to go around behind us and just pour ice water on us so that we could finish the job and complete the job before we left. All right, so, you know, we get tired physically sometimes, but I'm telling you, spiritually, we are strong. We are strong. And then it says, uh, it's perishing, yet the inner man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceedingly in eternal weight of glory. Now remember who's, who's writing this. Okay, the Apostle Paul. Remember what he had been through. Hold your finger there and go to 2 Corinthians 11. Just a few pages over. 2 Corinthians 11. We're going to start in verse 25. And when you compare what he said to this, I, I know sometimes I'm just ashamed. All right? Look what it says on 25, verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned three times. I was shipwrecked. A night and day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. He had went through all these things for the sake of the gospel. Verse 27, in weariness, in toil, and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all of the churches. He called it a light affliction. And folks, I'm telling you, we have to understand that God is the one who gives us the strength. God gives us direction. God gives us purpose. God helps us along the way. And then we see, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but we look, the, look at the things which are not seen. Folks, we all know this. I know you know this. It's basic part of Christianity. The things that we see are the things, like when I look out here, I see people. And, and that's things that we can see with our eyes. But the spiritual world is not like that. We cannot see. Now, we can see results of the spiritual world. But there are times in our lives that God is working and we don't even recognize that he's working. God is working in us. You see, if you remember the parable of the sower, folks, there's some that plant. There's some that, you know, uh, water. And there's some that reap. And we don't know where we are in that line. There are some people, I'm just telling you, there are people that just are reapers. I, I, they just, it's easy for them to lead people to Christ. But just us, the average person, planting those seeds, planting those seeds are just as important as the one that reaps the harvest. It's all investing in men, in, in, in lost, the lost man. And sometimes we don't see it right off. But I am telling you, I, I still, one of my favorite songs, and, and I just, I love it, it's called Thank You. Thank you for giving to the Lord. And again, it's not one of those, I can't wait to get to heaven and find out, you know, you know the times. Because there truly is, folks. You know, there's times that I preach a revival in another church and people get saved. And, and you know, it, it's just, it, it's really going to be neat to see that. And then it says, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know what the test of true ministry is? The test of true ministry is scars, not stars. I want to say it again. The test of true ministry is scars, not stars. Acts 20. Acts 20. Look there with me. This is Paul. 
meeting with the elders, the Ephesian elders, for Miletus to Ephesus. And he called for the elders of the church. And when they come to him, he said, you know, from the first day I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with humility and with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. You know what I think is missing in a lot of churches? Tears. I'm serious. I'm, I remember times in revivals where a God revival breaks out and I could literally hear people at the altar wailing. They weren't crying. They weren't trying to keep from crying. They were crying out to God. And folks, we need that in our churches, and we need that in our lives, where we don't really care what everybody else thinks during our invitation time. We're not ashamed to get out of the pews and come down and say, man, I need help. I need you to pray with me. And tears are so, so important, I believe, to true revival, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. What is he saying? Man, I, I, I shared the gospel. You know, there's not going to be blood on Paul's hands. Because everywhere he went, he shared the gospel. And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things which will happen to me, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. There were several times his disciples and Timothy and some of the folks tried to keep telling, Paul, you don't need to go there. You don't need to go there. You don't need to go there. They hate you there. They're going to arrest you. They're going to throw you in prison. But look at this, verse 24. This is what I want you to see. But none of these things move me. Folks, Paul was so in tune with Christ. Paul was so full of the Holy Spirit. Paul was uh, always concerned about God and his relationship with God and that what he was before Christ. I truly want to ask him, did that motivate you how you were because folks i'm just telling you he is one of the most dedicated christians in the bible and probably more dedicated than most christians here on earth but none of these things move me nor do i count my life dear to myself so that i may finish my race with joy and the ministry which i receive from the lord jesus christ there's that word again we all have a ministry folks to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Then the last one, in the last one, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 4. The rest of that verse we read earlier. For I'm now already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. Folks, I, I want to say this in my own life. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, would give to me on that day, and not, only to, not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearance. And folks, in this Thanksgiving season that we are going into, my sermon Sunday is Count Your Blessings. And I noticed you're seeing that, Steve. Good job there, buddy. But the key to contentment, the key to contentment is focusing on what you have in Christ and not focusing on what you don't have. Folks, we are a blessed church. We are a blessed people. We get to see God work in and through us. We see the baptismal waters moving. We see what God is doing in our lives. And folks, we don't need to take that for granted. Don't focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you have in Christ. And folks, I tell you, do not lose heart. Do not quit. Do not give up. Do not throw in the towel. I am telling you, God 
will help us through every situation in life. Father, thank you for the day. and God, I just thank you for Paul's life. And I'm certainly not, he, he is not you. But God, he was a committed Christian. He was a committed soul winner. He was a committed missionary. And God, just thank you for his example in his life and even his writings. And I know it's through the Holy Spirit. I know it's through God. But God, I just thank you that uh, he, he lived the life. He really did. He didn't just talk the talk. He walked the walk. And God, I pray that we will do that too. God, I pray that we won't lose heart. God, it's easy to get dis di you know, discouraged in times as these. But God, I pray that when we do that, We'll get that Bible out and we'll read even more. And we'll get on our knees and pray to you even more. And we'll get that Christian music out and look at the Psalms even. And just, God, I pray that we would just have just a personal revival, uh, just talking to you and fellowshipping with you and praying with you. God, you do. You give hope to the downhearted. And God, I pray that we would be messengers and ministers of hope to this lost and dying world. God, we love you. We thank you for your word, and thank you for this time tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.